Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, give a presentation to kind of set this, the, the, uh, uh, the context uh, that all of us are talking about. Uh, uh, w why uh, are we doing this thing, this smart grid thing? Uh, just uh, to give you a kind of an idea of what a utility is, Con Ed, where I worked for 43 years, uh, is uh, the utility that supplies New York City and Westchester County. Uh, it's got a lot of customers, a lot of wires, underground overhead, thousands and thousands of miles, a lot of infrastructure, billions and billions of dollars, lots of, of, of real estate, substations, big concrete boxes. Uh, each one of those sites uh, in today's real estate market would be hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, co couldn't be justified in terms of, of its current use. Uh, but there we are. Uh, we've got a uh, hundred years, as has been stated, of, uh, of legacy. Uh, we're supplying a vital service through a network of sorts. It's kind of a very different kind of network than what you guys are used to, used to thinking of. This is a fixed network. This is a network of predetermined pathways, largely. Very little switching so that the way that these extraordinary service levels and reliability are achieved. Uh, Mr. Arnold uh, quoted some numbers. Uh, uh, the, uh, I believe he, he was saying that the uh, uh, reliability in, or the outage rate in Tokyo was 24 minutes, average 24 minutes per year. Con Ed is, is about nine minutes or less. We're better than that. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, but I would suggest that well, we said per year, on average. Uh, and I, I remember when the, uh, the yes, uh, the, uh, but what I'd, I'd like to, to kind of focus on is that these kinds of extraordinary service levels are going to be more the norm than the exception. They're, they're going to be required for, for the kinds of service life. And there's always somebody like that in the crowd. Uh, this is what it takes. This is what it takes under the ground. To, uh, you, to build a fixed network to supply power in New York City. Is this, this is, these are re, uh, a couple of years old, this is typical, is that sustainable? Is that something that could support the increasing uh, needs that we're gonna have in these large cities for the next uh, 10 years, 20 years, let alone 30 or 40 or 50? It's not sustainable. So what are we talking about? What is this smart grid? Is it, it's a, it's a uh, it's gotten to be a cool word, but uh, this is obviously something that we've been working on for many, many decades, actually. Uh, the, what's happening, though, now is that these renewable uh, uh, resources, energy, is introducing a new kind of variable, this intermittency and, un and what we call, in, in our terms, unreliable, but it's, it's this chaotic uh, kind of a resource. Uh, uh, there are these mobile, and we've heard some of these comments and some of these observations are earlier from other speakers. Electric vehicles are significant loads and they move around. But there's also people out there at the end of the wire and they're wanting to make choices. They want to generate on their own. These concepts of cogeneration and microgrid, and they make sense. Uh, these local options. Uh, there's, uh, uh, and electricity, I would suggest, is becoming more, a more valuable uh, 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 energy resource and form in the way that it's being used in our society. Uh, it's increasingly vital to our personal, economic, and so societal well-being. That's kind of obvious. And I think it's going to be increasingly more so in the future. And the existing grid is aging and incompatible with these changes. That's why. So before the watts and the hows, this is the why. In terms of the network, it seems, uh, you know, to carry this analogy of the internet, what's missing is the switching capability, the reconfiguration. And Mr. Arnold was right in saying that a lot of the, the, uh, uh, the, the needs for making this grid more, more capable are very similar to what faced the communication grid uh, uh, 30 years ago. Except here we have to invent this router power. 
this idea of being able to do this kind, the mechanical device to do this kind of switching is not a trivial engineering uh, task. And I would suggest, despite Mr. Arnold's comments, it's not the same switch or even a, a related device to what was invented 30 years ago. Uh, this is a new device. And we created one uh, to, uh, and th there it is, the first of these devices, for a very special uh, application, and we're testing that now. I, I shouldn't say we anymore. Con Edison is testing that now. So that the, 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 this ki these kinds of new hardware, and I just wanted to show this, though, require some extraordinary computational capability to overlay this, to control this. And the kinds of issues like latency and communication don't really apply to, to uh, uh, electric, uh, uh, the flow of electrons. That's happening very quickly in a different way. But obviously, we're using a communication system to get the data. So we need to have the kind of intelligence which doesn't, I don't know of the computational capability that could do this, that could integrate that kind of uh, taking this late, late data and being able to make it somehow integrate with a real-time system and being able to do this over a broad geographical area. I hope I described that in some way that was comprehensible of what real, the computational challenges. I wanted to show the kinds of things that could happen, unintended consequences, haphazard kinds of things that can happen and the consequences of these things if these, uh, uh, for in this case example, electric vehicles happen in kind of a haphazard way in uncontrolled fashion. And I went through this thought exercise of creating a day in the life of an electric car and then aggregated that and saw that we, it would have the impact of requiring us to, to add 30 or 40 percent to the infrastructure in the city if it happened as a worst case. And if we had some real intelligence and ability to, to, to control that <clears throat> impact, we could have, have it have almost no impact. And what hopefully will happen is something that's in between those two extremes, closer to this, though. So that, that's what intelligence buys you. That's the value proposition. The value proposition is 30% of however many trillions of dollars that infrastructure would cost to build out nationwide. This is kind of what the picture looks like of what the smart grid is about. There's lots of devices that do things uh, that uh, charge and manage the electrons, there's communication pathways. We're doing a number of these projects and you may see variations on a theme of charts or diagrams that look like this and what, what they, they all resent, represent as some great conceptual things, but I would suggest that's not scalable. That's not real. That's a demonstration, that's a science project. And the, and the, the technology and, the, and the reliance on the communication, the security, there are many challenges. Just because it's on that piece of paper and just because there are charts and just because even there are, in some cases, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars being spent, we're talking about billions and billions and trillions of dollars to build that out. It's not scalable from this point upward. We need, this is a, a, the, the reason why I came here, because I believe that it's the IT aspect, it's the, it's the informational challenge that's going to be able to make this happen. That's the presentation. Uh, what, I, what I just wanted to add a, a little bit of, of some other comments uh, based on what I've heard up till, till now that maybe I didn't pick up. Uh, the the uh, technology, when you're talking about infrastructure, technology that we would deploy in, in the infrastructure, there's an aspect of it that's different than the technology maybe that you're used to in that when we talk about sustainability, the technology, the device needs to be able to be out there all alone, substantially unchanged, or at least not where you don't have to physically access it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So in an industry that think, thinks in terms of one or two years life of, or, th or five years as an antique for a, for a computer, that there's, an, there's a mismatch in that. Now, remote ability to upgrade, continuous ability to be able to maintain a compatibility in future generations could become serious constraints if you don't understand that from the beginning. 
Uh, also, I feel that, and this is based on the experience we had with our, our very good people that we worked with at the CCLS at Dave's group at Columbia University, is that the research is you guys in your place, in your, in your universities, I'm sure have wonderful ideas. And you might even have some ideas that you think might apply to us. And you might even think that you have a solution to something that we might need. And what we need to make sure, though, is that it's, a, it's something that we actually do need. And that what you're coming up with is not something that just can be done. So there needs to be a much closer relationship, a much closer, closer dialogue between the basic research, and I think we're talking basic research to, to help us with a lot of these things, the basic research and the real world. And we, we, we worked up a very interesting process we call the phase zero process that at Columbia, and, and they, they came to us seven or eight years ago with this great idea uh, for, for a, uh, a applying a, a, a learning technology uh, to build a threat simulator. And uh, it, it was fascinating to see what this thing uh, could do. Uh, but my basic comment to them when, after I saw it was, we don't need that. But the technology behind it was really intriguing. So what we did is said, let's step back a couple of steps. Let's get you guys to spend some time with our operations people and see what the real hurdles are and the real challenges are every day and tell, tell me what kinds of problems can you solve with this? Because this, and we identified about a dozen. And uh, we've picked uh, two or three that we've been working on for the last seven years and have made some really very significant advances. And there's still quite a few on that list that I think would work out. Also, what we found in this is that uh, the development of the technology was very multidisciplinary cross-disciplinary and iterative. Some of the best ideas came from the most left field kinds of re areas of research, at least thinking in terms of, yes, and there's one other comment. Uh, there, was a comment there was a comment that was made about the uh, value proposition, uh, the, the uh, idea of these microgrids. And I, I believe that is an important part of research, but I, I wanna kind of set the stage so that we understand what's going on uh, really, uh, it, to carry the, the internet analogy a little further, the, the, uh, um, uh, the value of a desktop computer all by itself on a desktop, it's okay. But the real value proposition is the grid, is when it's interconnected. I believe it's the same. The value proposition of the transactions are what really make the, val the, the thing that's going to create the real compelling value. 